Hello and welcome to this podcast from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is Robert Rudden Smith, author of Breakfast with Socrates, A Day with the World's Greatest Minds. In the book, Robert, a philosopher and management consultant, takes us through a typical day and shows us what new light the thought of some of the greatest philosophers and psychoanalysts can shed when we look at our everyday activities from a different angle. The epigraph to the book reads, How we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives, which I suggested to Robert provided a good way of approaching what he's investigating in his book. It's interesting, isn't it? When uh, people talk about philosophy, they think philosophy must be this grand metaphysical overarching schema populated by these rather forbidding characters who have systems like Hegel or categories like Aristotle. And of course, that's true. And yet, especially for people who want to understand the world of intellectual ideas, a much better way into that vast panoply of, of concepts is through this kind of the eye of the needle, which is everyday stuff and there's absolutely no reason why those mega themes can't become micro themes and be applied to to what we do every day and i think and i guess the more serious point is you know the way we spend our days really is how we live our lives and when we make big ethical choices we make them on a tuesday morning or a wednesday afternoon you know we don't make them outside of time so I think it's important to remember that, you know, ideas can be injected into the bloodstream of the everyday, not, not left outside it. And it's a kind of two-way process, isn't it? Because you can, you can illuminate the everyday through the big ideas. And it's also a way of coming at big ideas by means of showing how they relate to the everyday. Yeah, that's right. Let's not forget there is already a tradition of doing this. And I talk about Sartre in the very end of the book. I mean, Sartre, in a sense, has fallen out of fashion now, probably. But... There's an important sense in which he was saying, you know, look at the world around us. This is matter for reflection and for understanding and penetration and so on. And there's a famous analysis he does of a waiter in a cafe to illustrate this notion of bad faith, for example. You know, he says the waiter in the cafe typically is too much like the waiter. They, they, play, up a, they play a part. And uh, by playing a part, you lose a bit of your own freedom. You, you're acting out a role rather than, rather than being yourself. So again, you know, there is a tradition of this thinking. It's not a completely new thing, although you might think it is what with the democratization of knowledge is today. So just give me a, a, a tour d'horizon, Robert, of the book. What, what, where are you taking us? Okay. Well, the concept of the book is pretty straightforward, and it does what it says on the tin. It's the philosophy of everyday life. So the tour, in this case, is a tour literally of the day. And the book starts with waking up and goes through to falling asleep again at night. Uh, with all stops in between. So there's a chapter on getting ready to go out to work. There's a chapter on being at work, having lunch, going to the gym, going to a party, and so on and so forth. Uh, and if that's the kind of uh, temporal tour, if you like, then the, the intellectual tour takes in philosophy. And there is quite a lot of philosophy in the book, pretty eclectically. I mean, you've got your classics in there. You do have Plato and Socrates and so on but also quite a number of more recent philosophers. I'm very interested in Jacques Derrida and Georges Bataille, the kind of French post-structuralist tradition. So that's the philosophical aspect. But I'm also quite keen to bring in a fair amount of psychoanalysis and psychology and literature. So philosophy in this sense is, a, is, is shorthand, I guess, for you know, history of ideas. Are you implicitly saying that philosophy in and of itself is insufficient, is inadequate to explain our daily lives, that it takes us so far in a rational direction, but really we have to bring in the, the irrational and the subconscious, and that's where psychoanalysis really has to be um, brought into play. I think that's, uh, that's very helpful. I mean, you've helped me un understand my own book a bit better by saying that, actually. Uh, so I think, yeah, I, it's not that philosophy is inadequate. I mean, it might be my reading of philosophy is inadequate or my my range of philosoph philosophical understanding is inadequate. But I do think there is something about the experience of being in the world which is not entirely susceptible to rational explanation, be that philosophical or purely scientific. And I think we have a duty to explore what the boundaries of understanding are all the time, you know, regardless of what direction they take us in. So for me, it's always been important to be, quotes unquote, a bit fearless about where you take an idea. So it's not that I'm wedded to psychoanalysis, or it's not that I'm wedded to 
notions of telepathy, which I talk about a bit in the book. But I do feel that you know models of understanding the world have to evolve because the world will always be more complex than our understanding of it. Is it the case that you want to kind of jolt us out of our sort of complacency or our rut and make us think about things which we we take entirely for granted, like our sense of selves, perhaps, you know, and think about the the miracle of recovering consciousness in the morning and not just take that for granted, to, you know, to start at the beginning? Yeah, uh, well, yes, and two thoughts there. I mean, Heidegger had this uh, extraordinary phrase called, uh, in German, Seinsvergessenheit, which is this idea we forget that we're alive. And actually, we ought to be astonished by it. And there is something about the astonishment at being alive, which I think is one of the most fundamental aspects of being here. So that's the first point, which I guess is a, a philosophical or existential point. The second one, I guess, and without being too portentous about it, is a slightly more political point. That point is saying, if we don't think about things critically and reflective all the time, we are much more vulnerable to being manipulated politically and ideologically by forces that lie beyond our control. So there is something for me about thought which contains liberty in it, or at least contains the resistance to being manipulated or controlled. Now, I don't say that as such in the book, but if you're getting at my agenda, as it were, I, I guess that's part of it. So, for example, when you're talking about going to the gym, Michel Foucault is brought on with his sort of discourses of power. Yeah, yeah exactly. So <laughs> Foucault, as far as I know, never wrote about the gym per se, <laughs> although he was pretty fascinated in going to it for personal reasons of his own. And he was interested in all sorts of other uh, institutions, social institutions, uh, the prison, famously, hospitals and so on. And I think there's no reason why one can't borrow a kind of Foucauldian analysis to think about what the gym involves. We think of the gym as a perfectly benign space where we go and work out and make ourselves look better. But there's no reason why you can't take a slightly more sceptical Foucauldian approach and say, well, hang on a minute, any institution that's uh, carved out such a comfortable niche for itself in society is bound to be playing into the hands of a dominant ideology. Therefore, what does the gym do to preserve that ideology? Well, maybe there is something about producing regular bodies, which is tantamount to producing regular subjects, and therefore producing a kind of identikit world. <laughs> 